Yes. It's amazing. It really is. It's amazing how our whole world can change in just one day, one week. It really is. Tonight we're asking the question, the future of Israel, will it survive? Will it survive? That question has been asked many times down through Israel's history as she has fought five major bloody wars for her very existence and survival. Will Israel survive? Tonight, more specifically, Russia's coming invasion of Israel. Tonight, let's pray. I want to especially pray for you tonight. I want to pray for you tonight. And we're going to end tonight by praying for Israel. Amen? But if there's a need in your situation, your life tonight, uh, I want you to lift up your hand tonight as I pray. Would you lift up your hand if there's a need in your life? If you need a mountain moved, if there's healing that is needed, if there's provision that is needed, just lift up your hand. It's a demonstration of your faith. Amen. Lord, you have said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Lord, tonight we're asking, in the name of Jesus, we ask first and foremost for your anointing and your presence to be here tonight. Lord, we do not want this to be sensationalism. We want it to be God-focused. We want Jesus to be lifted up. He is the only answer for the world today. And Lord, you see these hands that are reaching out to you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, move in their situation. You're still the God who can move a mountain. You're still the God that conquers giants. You're still the God that can carry any burden that's too difficult for us to carry. We receive as we believe, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Bless us with your presence. Amen and amen. If you're watching us online, we welcome you tonight as we discuss the future of Israel. Will it survive? And most specifically, Russia's coming invasion of Israel. Israel at war. It's been called Israel's 9-11, if you want to write that down. The worst terrorist attack in Israeli history. Many of us recall on Saturday at 6.30 a.m. Saturday morning as Israel celebrated the end of the week. It's week-long festival. The Feast of Tabernacles, which is mentioned in the Bible, commemorating their time of passing through the wilderness and how God, God, sovereignly protected them. They also celebrated the Sabbath. And they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And then the horrifying sounds of the sirens began wailing across Israel. As the most massive ever rocket attack in Israel's history took place, the most number of missiles launched within an hour, slammed into southern and central Israel, including Jerusalem, leaving hundreds of bodies uh, in the streets. At the same time, Hamas terrorists invaded southern Israel by boat, by uh, pickup trucks, golf carts, motorcycles, bicycles, even motorized paragliders committing unspeakable atrocities that have shocked the world. They videoed themselves going into homes indiscriminately, massacring civilians. Family members watched in horror as they watched their loved ones butchered before their eyes. One young couple was able to place their baby, their twin babies in a, in, in a safe uh, house uh, panic room situation and they themselves were butchered and only their babies well, were saved. Countless babies as you know were, were decapitated and at a music festival they arrived the terrorists in vans and opened up with machine guns 
and, and, and mowed down the young people at the music festival like a shooting gallery. Over 260 just at that one festival were killed. And then the whore of whores. Perhaps you've seen the video clips of young women, mothers, children, even the elderly being kidnapped and taken down into tunnels or taken by golf carts or shoved in to, to, to minivans. And then they were paraded through the streets of Gaza. Uh, and even a Holocaust survivor was kidnapped in a wheelchair. Hamas is now claiming more than 250 hostages, including 11 American citizens, are being held hostage. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has declared, this is not a so-called military operation, not another round of fighting, but war. Israel is at war. As of today, the death toll, the death toll in Israel has surpassed 1,200 with many more bodies to count. Another 2,900 people have been injured in Israel. Among the dead are at least 14 American citizens and an undetermined um, number have been taken hostage by Hamas. The terrorist attack of Hamas on Israel is really worse than our 9-11. When you view it proportionately in terms of population, if the same attack occurred on U.S. soil, more than 35,000 Americans would have been killed. So you need to realize we're a nation of about 350 million Israel's only a nation of less than 10 million. So if you look at it proportionately, this is a huge, way worse than 9-11 and Pearl Harbor combined. An attack on Israel. It's becoming abundantly clear. Hamas was not only funded, equipped, and trained but directed by Iran in its terrorist attack upon Israel. I want to remind you that both Hamas and Hezbollah are terrorist organizations. Sponsored by who? Iran. Iran. How much money last year was Hamas given by Iran? Over 100 million dollars. Hezbollah, how much are they funded annually, annually by Iran? More than 700 U.S. dollars, million dollars is funded to Hezbollah by Iran on an annual basis. Both Hamas and Hezbollah are terrorist organizations headed up by Iran. Hamas controls the Gaza Strip of more than two million Palestinians. Hezbollah operates north of Israel in, in Syria. Iran, again, funds them, equips them, trains them. And for years, these terrorist organizations have plagued Israel with death and destruction. The Wall Street Journal just reported this, and I quote, Iran helped plot attack on Israel over several weeks is the headline. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard gave the final go-ahead a week ago Monday. In Tehran, maybe you saw it in the news, on Saturday, on the day of the attack, what were they doing in Tehran, the capital of Iran? They were applauding, they were celebrating, they were waving flags and banners, shooting off fireworks and shouting, death to Israel, death to the United States. Iran has stated for decades their objective is, is to what? Destroy who? Israel. Israel. 
They are or have already developed nuclear weapons. In the past, they have threatened to, in their own words, to wipe who off the face of the earth? Israel. One Iranian leader said this, and he's pictured here, Ahmadinejad, however you pronounce his name, they ask, is it possible for us to witness a world without America and Zionism? But you had best know that this slogan and this goal are altogether attainable and surely can be achieved. The regime that is occupying Jerusalem must be wiped off the map. He's the same one that holds an annual conference that declares that the Holocaust never ever happened. That it's fictional. What could happen next? What could happen next? What, what should we brace ourselves for? What could happen next? Israel could very well attack Iran. She's threatened to do this for years to keep her from developing and going nuclear. But now, now there is great incentive. A scenario which could bring planet Earth World War III. You see, Israel is just attacking the snake right now. But Israel realizes she needs to attack and cut off the head of the snake. And the head of the snake is Iran. An attack by Israel on Iran could very well produce the prophetic war that is revealed to us in Ezekiel chapter 38 which is known as the War of Gog and Magog. The beginning of World War III. In Ezekiel 37, the prophet, the prophet Ezekiel, was transported by the Spirit to a valley of dry bones. God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. God told Ezekiel to prophesy, to speak to the dry bones. And Ezekiel obeyed. Can you imagine the rattling noise as bones came together, skeletons formed, then flesh came on the skeletons, uh, sinew, muscle, but they stood there like the walking dead. The scripture says, fully formed, but no breath of life was within them. Then God said to Ezekiel in chapter 37, verse 9, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. Ezekiel obeyed. And the living breath of God came into the bodies and they opened their eyes and lived. Now note the prophecy. Verse 11. Then he said, God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We are cut off. And this is exactly what they were saying at the end of the Nazi Holocaust. Our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open uh, your graves and bring you up from them. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. For nearly 2,000 years, think of it, for nearly 2,000 years, the Jews, like scattered dry bones, had been scattered across the world. Especially during the Nazi Holocaust, we could hear Israel saying, We are a heap 
of dry bones. All hope is lost. But God, I said, but God, I said, but God, <laughs> brought them back together on May the 15th. 1948 and just as the the Bible prophesies in one day in one day a nation was birthed a, a nation was born and Israel became a sovereign nation again with Jerusalem as her capital for the first time in 3,000 years not you have to go all the way back to King Solomon to find the Israel that you see today, you have to go all the way back to King Solomon to see a sovereign nation with Jerusalem as her capital. Israel's rebirth, Israel's regathering, Israel's survival can only be explained in one word. God. 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 Bible scholar J. Vernon McGee noted, and I quote, look on the screen, they have a flag, they have a constitution, they have a prime minister, and they have a parliament, they have a police force, and an army, they have a nation, and they even have Jerusalem, they have everything except true spiritual life. True spiritual life. Only 1% of the population, 1% are Christ followers. More than 80% are secular. They're non-religious. Most don't even believe in the existence of God. After this class, we're going to have the ushers tonight after this presentation take an offering because our missionaries, the McCombers, are on the ground there in, Mish in Israel and they have stated even if we are called to evacuate, even if the United States asks Americans to evacuate, we're staying put. We're going to minister unto these our dear Israeli friends and we're going to ask for eyes to be open at this time of tragedy that they may discover the true Prince of Peace. The true Prince of Peace. Israel spiritually can be compared to these walking dead that are mentioned in Ezekiel 7. Bodies without breath. They haven't recognized their true Messiah. But very soon, very soon, very soon they will. The Bible prophesies in Revelation 1 that they will behold Him whom they pierced coming to rescue them in the clouds. After the battle that we're about to describe tonight, the world will know proof positive that God is in control. You see, the Bible reveals in the last days when Israel returns to her homeland and Israel is at peace, invasion will come. In Ezekiel 38, the next chapter over, God speaks to the invader. Throughout most of this chapter, God is speaking and He's addressing Israel's coming invader. Let's read the scripture. Verse 8, a long time from now, you will be called into action. Again, God's speaking to the invader. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war, and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. You and all your allies, a vast and awesome army will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I want you to note here that Ezekiel is prophetically seeing this invasion coming down upon an end times Israel the reborn Israel of our day. An Israel that is dwelling in villages and cities without what? Walls. 
in ancient time, a village, a city without walls was unheard of. Unheard of. But walls are not needed in a time and an age that has radar, that has sonar, that has many of the warning systems that relate to a nation, a country, a people that attack is coming. How could Ezekiel have known 25 centuries ago of rockets, missiles, aircraft, radar, anti-ballistic systems like Iron Dome that's operating right now that would make walls and ancient gates of cities irrelevant for defensive purposes. There's only one answer. How would he know this? God. God. This horrific coming invasion of Israel is not the Battle of Armageddon. Do not equate this war that I'm about to unfold before you as the Battle of Armageddon. It's known in Bible prophecy as the War of Gog and Magog. The Bible's prophetic accuracy is so amazing that in Ezekiel 38, God reveals the ruler and his military power that will lead a coalition of forces to attack Israel. Let's read on. Ezekiel 38 again. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around. I will put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Linguistically, it can be demonstrated that Rosh is related to the modern word Russia. And Meshach and Tubal are variations of the spellings of Moscow and Tobolsk. Ezekiel 39 verse 2 God says I will take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Jewish commentaries say that this phrase the northern or the remotest parts of the north can also be the northernmost extremity of the civilized world. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, in chapter 11 of Daniel, also speaks about the leader of the invasion that is to come. Daniel 11 speaks about the king of the north. Draw a straight line from Israel a straight line north and where do you end up when it comes to the extreme north? Moscow, Russia. Ezekiel 38 2 refers to Gog or the Prince of Rosh. This is the leader of the invading coalition of military powers that come against Israel in the last of the last days. This leader Prince of Rosh, Russia, has the ability to forge alliances, to bring military might together, to form a confederacy of militaries, nations. This fits Putin perfectly. Putin has steadily been at work forging political economic and military alliances during his regime. He is the perfect, I'm not saying proof positive, but I will tell you his actions, his behavior with Ukraine unmasked him and his history with the KJB, KGB and, and 
his many alliances that he has created and he's attempting to with China even you know what was happening Saturday when the attack came there was military exercises in the Persian Gulf with Russia China and Iran going on at the same time he's a perfect candidate to be the Gog of Ezekiel 38 read with me verses 5 through 6 Persia Ethiopia Libya are with them all of them with shield and helmet Gomer and all its troops the house of Togomar from the far north and all its troops many people are with you you write it down God identifies the invaders joining Russia and we can transpose these ancient names into their modern equivalent. Those nations are, when we transpose them into their modern equivalency, those nations are Syria, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Libya, Sudan, Turkey, and the nations of Eastern Europe. And this is exactly the evil access of power that we see today aligning itself against Israel. Think of it. Just a lifetime ago, just one lifetime ago, Ezekiel's prophecy, the war of Gog and Magog, would have been a complete impossibility. The prophecy that we're analyzing tonight, just a lifetime ago, would have been completely impossible. Why would I say that? Russia and other nations were backward economically, militarily, downright primitive. Russia was not aligned in any confederacy with any of the Arab Islamic nations. It wasn't until 1935 that the nation of Persia changed its name to the nation of Iran. Do you realize that? Plus, a hundred years ago, a lifetime ago, Israel did not even exist. It's not until our generation, and that's a whole sermon right there, when you consider all of the prophecies coming together in one generation. We are that generation. We have witnessed more prophetic fulfillment than any other generation in all of church history since Jesus Christ. What would be the motivation of Israel's invaders, Russia, and her Islamic coalition? Why would they attack? Why would they want to invade Israel? The hottest piece of real estate on the planet is where? Beverly Hills? Huh? What's the hottest piece of real estate on the planet? Jerusalem. And even more specifically, what? The 37 acres of the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is Islam's third most holiest site. There is only one thing that would ever, ever unite the divisive Muslim world because they're always fighting among themselves. But there's one thing that would unite the Muslim world and that's their hatred for the Jewish state called Israel and their burning passion to control Jerusalem, the Holy Land, push the Israelis into the sea. Islamic groups like Hamas and Hezbollah believe that it's Allah's will for them to rule the earth and kill all Jews and kill all Christians. Don't forget what ISIS did to Christians. 
They want to control Jerusalem. They want to, and to control Jerusalem, they must conquer Israel. As long as breath remains in their bodies, they will fight Israel to the death. And no matter how much talk there is about peace, an Islamic jihad, a holy war is coming. I have predicted that for 25, 30 years in Bible prophecy classes. And we saw it right on our TVs on Saturday. Russia in her Muslim coalition could even legally, write the word legally down, they could legally invade Israel. Most of the United Nations is anti-Israel. Russia could invade Israel with the same UN resolutions that the United States used for organizing a coalition of nations that went into Iraq and then went into the Persian Gulf and then finally Afghanistan. In all of those instances, we went in under a United Nations legal resolution and flag. Russia could use the same excuse. They could use the excuse of the protesters that we're seeing around the world right now that are rooting, rooting, not for Israel, but for Hamas. And calling Israel an apartheid state. And under a UN flag and a UN resolution, Israel, I mean, could be attacked and invaded by Russia and a coalition of nations with a United Nations resolution. Russia will say to the Islamic nations, you want Jerusalem and the Temple Mount? We want to be a superpower again? Let's join forces to rule the world. And what's the end result? A massive pan-Islamic military force led by Russia with its great and mighty arsenal and its military uh, experience invading Israel. The Bible says that when they come down in Ezekiel 38, they will be like a cloud to cover the land. Tiny, tiny Israel. Most of us don't have any idea, proportionately, the sliver of land called Israel. At its narrowest point, Israel is only 60 miles wide. That's between here and Flint. Think of it. And there's, here's tiny Israel, less than 10 million, surrounded by more than 500 million Arabs and, and, and Muslim nations. There's seven reasons, seven reasons. I want you to get these reasons tonight. I'll flash them up on the screen. There's seven reasons why Russia would lead a coalition of Israel's enemies to attack Israel. Number one, number one, seven reasons of motivation. Number one, Russia would attack Israel because it's been following the expansionist strategy, blueprint, and game plan crafted by the Tsar Peter the Great. Peter the Great, the greatest Tsar of Russia, and the one that Putin adores, last, left a last will and testament. It was a blueprint for Russia of the future. It was completely an expansionist ideal. That's why it's according to this blueprint that Putin followed. That's why they invaded Ukraine. The second largest republic in the Soviet Union, second only to Russia, and the biggest breadbasket nation for Russia supplying wheat and bread. And inclusive in this plan of Peter the Great that Russia follows is controlling the Middle East. Number two, Russia desperately wants to be a superpower again. Key to this world domination is control of the Middle East. Key to the Middle East is the defeat of Israel. Israel is the only, the only democracy in the entire Middle East and the only true ally of the United States. 
and it's one of the most powerful militaries in the world. They have to take out Israel in order to control the Middle East. Number three, number three, Russia needs a fresh infusion of hard currency. No matter the outcome with their invasion of Ukraine, the Russian economy will be dangerously weak. Their greatest resource right now is not their oil or their gold. Their greatest resource is their arsenal of weaponry that they want to sell to the highest bidder. It's their war knowledge, their military experience which Russia can sell to this Muslim coalition. Number four, number four, control of the oil-rich Persian Gulf would bring America and the West to their knees. I was a gas station attendant in 1973. I have always been a pastor, a preacher, or teacher. And I can remember back when gasoline was 55 cents a gallon or less mile long lines waiting to get gas and I had over a thousand dollars in my pants pockets as I'm filling up one car after another and exchanging monies at that time where you never saw credit cards uh, at all uh, at the pump uh, I remember the oil embargo. Many of us do. You talk about bringing America to her knees. And don't think, don't you'd be naive to think that oil is only for gasoline. They make hundreds, hundreds of different products out of oil. It would bring America to her knees and most of the West. Number five, six of Russia's ten republics. Six out of ten states in Russia are controlled by Islamic fundamentalists. Most of Russia is Islamic. Most don't know that. Number six, by controlling the land of Israel, Russia would control the most strategic location on the planet. Many don't realize why it's the promised land. One of the great reasons Israel is the promised land is that it's a land bridge between three continents. It's a land bridge between three continents. Additionally, Israel has access to every ocean on the planet. It is probably the most strategic piece of real estate on the planet. The perfect place for a superpower to exercise global domination. Number seven, both Russia and her Islamic allies will be so demonically inspired in their Jewish hatred, they will be driven to annihilate Israel, the only Jewish state on the planet. This is the same demonic hatred that possessed Pharaoh in Egypt when Moses said, let my people go. This is the same demonic hatred that drove Haman in the book of Esther to commit genocide of the entire Jewish race. But God stepped in through Queen Esther who saved her people. This is the same demonic hatred that inspired Antiochus Epiphanes in the intertestamental period. Uh, and, and, and thousands of Jews were slaughtered and massacred. This is the same hatred that inspired King Herod on Christmas night to go out and kill baby boys one after another. What you saw on Saturday is not a first. This is what inspired the Spanish Inquisition to kill countless Jews. Uh, and of course, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Holocaust or Stalin's persecution of the Jews. We don't know how many millions, some believe more than Adolf Hitler, perished under Stalin's reign than even Adolf Hitler. Do we see a stream that runs through world history with the Jewish people? There, are, there is no people group that has been more persecuted and more slaughtered than the Jewish people. You need to understand that. It will find its ultimate fulfillment. Hatred of the Jews 
in a seven year time period in Bible prophecy that is known as the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist will make Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy as millions of Jews will be persecuted and killed under his reign. His favorite form of execution will be beheading. The scripture is very clear on this. Why does Satan so hate the Jewish people? Not just because Jesus was born a Jew, their Messiah, but Satan cannot, cannot attack God directly. So who does he attack? The apple of God's eye. You want to hurt me? Touch my children. You don't have to worry about me. It's the mama bear that you got to worry about. Yeah. And the grandchildren. That's right. That's why God calls the Jews the children of Abraham. That's why he calls them the apple of his eye. The apple of his eye. You see, it's only in our generation that a host of prophetic descriptions of destruction have been understood as nuclear warfare. Nuclear warfare. There's a host of prophecies in the Bible that were not understood until the first atomic bomb was dropped. For instance, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree. When shaken by a strong wind, the sky receded like a scroll, rolling up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every Every free man hid in what? When an earthquake takes place, where, where's the last place you want to be? A cave. But where do they go when the atomic bombs start dropping? Underground bunkers. Or in an ancient world, they called them caves and among the rocks of the mountains. How could, how could I ask you according to this prophecy, how could an earthquake affect the atmosphere? They don't. How could the sun turn black or the moon, the moon be turned blood red in, in an earthquake? It doesn't. Why would the, the, the revelator call falling stars falling stars because he had never seen missiles streaming through the sky like we're seeing uh, over uh, Israel or the sky receding like a scroll have you ever taken uh, uh, have you ever taken a, 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 a shade and pull it down and then let go of it that's what you see described in, in, in Revelation chapter 6. And that's exactly what happens when a nuclear device is ignited. It is so powerful, it separates the atmosphere. Then the atmosphere comes back again with a boom, like lightning and thunder. We've come a long way since the advent of the atomic bomb. A long way. An atomic bomb, which is just a one megaton nuclear blast, is literally a firecracker compared to the massive H-bomb. An H-bomb creates a great noise, instantly vaporizing everything within a two-mile radius. In a two-mile radius, everything just disappears. Imagine everything around us as far away as Henry Ford Hospital over there on 19 Mile, atomized, vaporized, disappearing and for the next eight miles everything instantly catches fire the land becomes a raging inferno a literal hell on earth and 35 miles out radiation makes the earth good for nothing for a thousand years our generation has even even perfected the cobalt bomb in our great wisdom, we have created the cobalt bomb, the most lethal weapon known to man. A cobalt bomb is, is made by placing cobalt-59 metal around an H-bomb, effectively doubling the destructive capacity of the hydrogen bomb. Never forget the arsenal. 
controlled by the, the Russians. As of 2023, Russia has 11 nuclear-powered submarines capable of firing ICBMs with multiple thermonuclear warheads, meaning that these submarines alone could deliver 1,185 nuclear warheads. Launched from underwater, they can hit 95% of our major population centers in less than eight minutes from launch. Eight minutes. And was it just last week they practiced and rehearsed the national warning system on your phones and other devices? What was that a rehearsal for? Last August, last August, the media group, The Hill, stated this, Russia is deploying Zircon, Zircon hypersonic missiles on their new Yasin class nuclear powered stealthy submarines. Ruth, you need to go to the picture of the missile. The missile, not the submarine, the missile. There you go. These hypersonic missiles, tra that's a submarine. There you go. They travel at five times the speed of sound. Uh, and are maneuverable in the air. They can turn them where they want to turn them. They are so fast, our anti-ballistic systems cannot bring them down. Five times the speed of sound. The United States right now is in a race to catch up with Russia and China, who are far more advanced in hypersonic missile technology. Remember, the Russians have the most nuclear weapons in the world. They have enough nuclear weapons to totally wipe out all U.S. military targets several times over and still have 8,000 nuclear warheads left. That's enough bombs to hit every city, every town, every village in the United States with a population of 1,500 or more, each with an impact of 80 times more powerful than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Bottom line? The Russians would run out of targets long before they'd run out of bombs. Just before, just before Russia invaded Ukraine, did you hear what Putin said? He said this, and I quote, Today's Russia remains one of the most powerful nuclear states. Moreover, it has certain advantage in several cutting-edge weapons. In this context, there should be no doubt for anyone that any potential aggressor will face defeat and ominous consequences should it directly attack our country. But Pastor Phil, Pastor Phil, look at Russia's performance in Ukraine. Number one, I will remind you, they haven't gone nuclear yet. They haven't gone nuclear. And that's why we have not gotten involved directly. Because the threat that I just read was directed mainly at the West, the United States, to not get involved directly. Secondly, remember Germany. Germany had far less population than Russia far less land, far less resources, and far less military power. And they almost conquered the world. Every year, scientists, mostly Nobel laureates, move the hands of a clock. That clock has a name. Do you know the name of that clock? The Doomsday Clock. They move the hands either further away or closer to the midnight hour, doomsday. With the war in Ukraine and now what's happened in Israel, the hands of the clock are closer to midnight than ever before, just seconds to midnight. When the war of Gog and Magog will take place, when will it take place? The war of Gog and Magog prophetically in the Bible must take place before, before the Great Tribulation. For what begins and constitutes the Great Tribulation? 
the Great Tribulation begins not with the rapture. The Great Tribulation begins when the Antichrist signs a seven-year treaty with Israel, guaranteeing Israel's security and peace for seven years. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, this begins the seven-year Great Tribulation. The peace will be so secure for a war-weary Israel that the Bible says they will hail the Antichrist, the Israelites. They'll hail the Antichrist as their long-sought, long-prayed-for Messiah. Their greatest dream, but their greatest dream, the mask will come off and he'll end up being their worst nightmare. But that's a whole nother presentation, a whole nother lesson. So the war of Gog and Magog could not take place during the Great Tribulation because the Antichrist has secured the peace of Israel. All scriptural evidence, all of it, points to the war of Gog and Magog taking place at any time. Any time. I believe what happened on Saturday, this is my personal opinion, I believe what happened on Saturday with Israel declaring war for the first time in 50 years, along with the brutal atrocities that have been paraded across TV and the Internet, I'm of the personal opinion as a student of Bible prophecy for many decades that we have been put on a fast track for World War III, the war of Gog and Magog, the Great Tribulation, the one world government, the one world economy, the one world religion. I'm talking about the beast, the Antichrist, 666. If I had a hotline to the White House, I would say, Mr. President, stop listening to the tree-hugging Green New Deal liberals. Stop listening to the squad. Stop listening to AOC. Stop giving terrorist states like Iran billions, billions of dollars. And start closing our borders and start opening up God's Word. Read what's coming with China. Read what's coming with Russia. Read what's coming with Israel. Our greatest national security, Mr. President, is not our gold, it's not our guns, but our God. Please lead our nation back to in God we trust. In God we trust. When Russia and its allies attack Israel, the Bible says God will act. Just as God was in control of the entire Satan-inspired crucifixion of Jesus, God will be in control of the war of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38, I will turn you around, I will put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army. Who's doing this? God. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, O God, I will bring you out against my land so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. God is orchestrating all of this. He's in charge. On that day, on that day when Israel stands alone against Israel, Russia and its allies, Israel's guardian, will attack. Ezekiel 38 verse 18, my fury will show in my face. Psalms 121, behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Think of it. After watching his chosen people, the Jews of the Holocaust, walk into the gas chambers, after seeing the apple of his eye thrown into the ovens of Germany and their ashes dumped by the tons into Europe's rivers, after seeing Stalin and Russia's persecution of Jews, after seeing the land of milk and honey run red with Jewish blood in five major wars that she has fought for her 
own survival after seeing Hamas's attack and brutal atrocities this past weekend God will stand up God will shout to the nations enough is enough and on that day of days when Israel will feel that all hope is lost as Russia invades, God will destroy her enemies by doing four things. Four things. Number one, God himself will show up on the battle scene. The Bible says that when God steps down onto planet Earth, that a great massive earthquake will occur. Look at verse 20. And all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. Number two, God will send massive confusion into the invaders. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Verse 21. Zechariah spoke of that day. On that day they will be terrified, stricken by the Lord with great panic. They will fight their neighbors hand to hand. Hand. Number three, God will send a consuming plague. Verse 22, I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed. Zechariah said, the Lord will send a plague on all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their people will become like walking corpses. Their flesh rotting away. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Number four, God will open fire with his divine artillery. Verse 22, I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. Ezekiel doesn't reveal how many will die in the war of Gog and Magog. But he tells us how many will survive. Verse 2 of chapter 39. I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. The casualty rate for this battle will be an unheard of 84%, which is unheard of in modern warfare. The Bible reveals that the world will know proof positive at this time that God that the Almighty rescued Israel. Verse 23 of chapter 38, I will show my greatness and my holiness. I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know I am the Lord. The questions often asked me, Pastor, where is America? history's greatest superpower when Israel is invaded. I ask you tonight, where is America? I believe the Bible makes a big statement about the United States talking about Bible prophecy through its silence. I see four scenarios in the future for America. Number one, just like with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, America will be unwilling to get directly involved. Number two, maybe because of economic collapse, where we have now surpassed $33 trillion in debt, the payment on just the interest, because of interest rates going up, the payment we have I've just started making on the interest on the national debt surpasses what we fund national defense for for the first time in our history we could be missing from Bible prophecy because of economic collapse number three we could be missing because we have suffered nuclear destruction thus emboldening Russia to move on Israel. I began tonight with the question, will Israel survive? And I submit to you, it's not a question of if Israel will survive. Will America survive? I can say to you, proof positive, Israel is going to survive. She's the apple of God's eye. The scenario, the fourth scenario, the one I hope for the most 
to explain why America is missing in all of Bible prophecy is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What is this event that the Bible prophesies about? The rapture. Stand with me tonight if you would. Stand with me. Don't think, don't think it will be business as usual for our world after Saturday. Saturday changed our world forever. Ruth, could you give me, yes, world leaders, military powers, in fact, the entire world is bracing itself for what's coming next. Will Israel openly attack Iran and cut off the head of the snake? That'll immediately bring Russia onto the battle scene because Russia has a military alliance with Iran. But the message of Bible prophecy is this. God is in control. <laughs> God is on the throne. And everything is going to be all right. Especially if you're a born-again, blood-bought, Bible-believing, demon-fighting soldier of the cross. Amen. Especially if you know that you know that you know that Jesus is the Savior of your soul. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Hey, we never thought 9-11 would happen, but it did. We never thought a global pandemic like COVID would happen, but it did. We never thought such a horrific death and brutality would happen in Israel before our very eyes, but it did. Countless souls Never think the rapture will take place, but it will. It will. It will. How about it? Will you be going up? You see, there's coming a moment in time where the eastern skies will unzip and blood, <laughs> blood-covered ears will hear what unbelieving ears cannot hear. Blood-washed eyes will see what unbelieving eyes cannot see. The eastern skies will unzip, and the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain, we will be caught up <laughs> in the air to be with Him forever and ever and evermore. I implore you, don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. We have missionaries in Israel. Matthew and Randy McComer with their three little girls. I should have pulled up a picture of them. We keep them in prayer. They're staying put no matter what to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to have the ushers standing at the doors. And tonight as you leave and the next class comes in, if you're able to, I know guys you already gave on Monday night, but if you're able to, we'd love to give a great missionary offering because what Israel really needs is her true Messiah. Amen? How about you? Are you right with God? Is your name written in the book, the Lamb's Book of Life? I pray. You won't be left behind. Let's pray right now. Let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for the peace of Israel, the peace of Jerusalem. Oh God, oh God, you've called us to pray for peace and leave everything else in your hands. You have an agenda for the nations. 
We have an agenda for our own lives. And Lord, we trust you. And Lord, tonight, if we're not sure we're right with you, help us to be certain. Help us to surrender and invite you, Jesus, to be the Lord, the Savior of our lives. Lord, we lift up our missionaries who are dedicated to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in Israel. We lift up Matthew and, and Randy McComber and their three daughters. Preserve them, protect them, and especially empower them to share good news, light in the darkness. Now may the grace of the Father, the love of the Son, Christ Jesus, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be upon one and all. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. I love you. Go with God. Thank you for being here tonight.